Well, hello, friends. Won't you join me here by the fire? And as we settle on in, I have a question. I just, I was wondering if you, like me, are feeling quite over this year, uh, quite done with 2020. Well, I have great news. Today, right now, is actually the beginning of a new year according to the church calendar. That's right. Happy New Year! We can just say goodbye to 2020 and lean into this new year because it's arrived. We're here. And it's Advent, the four Sundays leading us to Christmas, and it begins right now. So let's get cozy by the fire, go grab that hot cocoa, and we can just proceed into December and all the twinkly light goodness that we love in this season and forget that 2020 ever happened. It will be just like every other Advent and Christmas that we have ever known. Okay, it won't be like any Advent and Christmas that we have ever known. And today, though it is a new year, according to the church calendar, we still have a month to go in 2020. And even when we flip the old calendar to January 1st, 2021, I think 2021 is still going to feel and look a whole lot like 2020 for a while. Not a lot will have changed for us. Still global health crisis with all its repercussions, still racial reckoning in ourselves and our country will still be stretched across a political divide that has grown so wide and intolerant. But here's the thing, even though this won't be the Advent and Christmas, we know and love and choose. It's our intention together here at Salt House to set ourselves up to experience this God with us as we really are now in all of the particularities and chaos and injustice and loss and loneliness of the year 2020. And your Salt House staff, we have curated the opportunities to share in this experience by setting up rhythms of practice for us to do together, even at a distance. I want to touch on these Advent practices. Uh, Many of these practices are in your cozy kit, your Advent cozy kit. And if you did not get a cozy kit, we we create instructions for how uh, you can access these things at home uh, with just a little bit of effort and time. So go to that. It's all on our Advent page on our website. So we've curated multiple daily rhythms. Uh, First, the Advent paper chain, a traditional countdown calendar. Uh, with a twist. So each day you pull off one of these links and there's a QR code there uh, where you'll find an intention for the day um, along with the QR code and it'll take you to online daily activities as you scan the code each day. And you'll find everything from like funny videos to poetry to coloring sheets to movie recommendations, just really fun, meaningful ways to experience the fullness of this season for folks of all ages pro tip, kids are going to love scanning those codes every day. I mean, I know I'm going to love it too. So that's one of those daily rhythms. Also daily, there's a daily devotional book, Honest Advent by Scott Erickson. And those readings, uh, they're done by chapters, chapter 1 through 25. December 1st is chapter 1. And so we just read our way through one chapter a day. And with those daily readings, there's a visual art as well as some content. So we'll stimulate our senses through both of those. And if you don't have a copy yet, you can order. They have it available on Kindle. You can order copy. Um, order today. The readings begin officially this Tuesday. And also we have weekly Advent rhythms. We'll have uh, a weekly coffee hour after worship. Uh, just a chance to check in and name one thing that we heard in the sermon time or that we want to speak about that spoke to us from the book. So that's going to be on, on Sundays. Um, starting today, so we'd love for you to join that call today. On Sundays during worship also, we'll light the Advent candles here, and then at the same time, you'll be able to light yours at home. Uh, You'll light an additional blue candle each Sunday, marking those four Sundays of Advent, seeing the light grow as we draw closer to Christmas, so we'll do that shortly today. Then through your week, you can light your candles again, like keep them lit whatever week we're on uh, each evening, as maybe as you gather around the dinner table. Also on Sundays, our Advent journey will very much be marked by our Sunday morning sermons, right? Just like Scott's book, our conversations and experience here on Sundays will open us up to an honest Advent to reveal our sermon series for Advent and Christmas 2020. Here is our series trailer to set it all up for us. Did you hear? 
One of our local businesses has arranged for a cardboard cutout of Santa to be positioned outdoors for folks to come and snap a selfie with Santa. Masks required, of course, except for the brief moment when you snap your photo. Another local place will have actual live Santa there, but seated on bleachers, separated by plexiglass, and you can sit 10 feet away on the bleachers with Santa. On one level, I'm deeply appreciative of the creativity and ingenuity, the like making it work to still have a photo with Santa this year. But on the other hand, man, I am just so tired of figuring out how to adapt everything in order to make it work in 2020. So when it comes to Advent, we don't want to expend the energy to figure it all out and make it work. I'm so weary. Are you feeling this weariness too? We just want to like be in Advent and Christmas. And so for Advent and Christmas here at Salt House, though we have to be physically distanced, we're not adapting it, not just making it work. We're heading into it as we are and as it is, letting ourselves experience what Jesus' incarnation reveals to us, that the word of God is incarnated in human vulnerability. We see it in the Jesus story then, and it's what we experience now. The word of God is incarnated in human vulnerability, which is why our Advent sermon series is simply called, Be Not Afraid. It is how the angels greeted Mary and Joseph, be not afraid. It is declared to the shepherds in the fields after Jesus' birth, be not afraid. It is what we've needed to hear in the last nine months, be not afraid. It is something we'll say to one another as we draw nearer to the manger, be not afraid. And we'll need to say it and hear it because if the word of God is incarnated in human vulnerability, then we're walking this Advent road into our vulnerability as we explore the themes of hope, embodiment, blessing, and love. So friends, be not afraid as we open to how we're really doing and who we really are For here in our ordinary everyday vulnerabilities, we will be met by the coming Emmanuel, our God with us now. Friends, take a deep breath and exhale. For this Advent, we will not ask you to pretend that everything is fine, I'm fine, we're fine, nor do we have to like, make it work, but it's an invitation to inhabit the scary territory we are living in with intention, curiosity, and a deep conviction that God will meet us in this vulnerable work. Yes? Yes. And so my friends, let's begin this Advent journey now. I invite you into your own vulnerable places where you are aching, aging, weary, broken, and in need. I know that I am ready to like be met in my weary vulnerability because I don't have enough steam left to keep it all together after all this year has been. So friends, cozy up with me now by this fire as that we may just be met by God in our weariness and our honest vulnerability. You in? You good? Okay, let's do it. So here we go into the first Sunday of Advent. So we're turning today to the gospel reading from the lectionary, which is the assigned texts for this particular Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, and mainline churches around the globe will be reading the same text today. So it's from Mark 13. So at this point in Jesus' life, Jesus has already made his triumphant ride into Jerusalem. He then lays down some of his best teaching, including like the most important, the greatest commandments. And then right before what we're gonna read, Jesus speaks prophecies about what is to come. And it's just awful. It's horrible struggle and destruction that God's people will face. And then in our text, Jesus says more about what will happen as and after these horrible things have happened. So I invite you to just let yourself hear and envision the text 
as it is as we hear this, okay? So thank you to Jim Anderson for reading. This is Mark 13, 24 through 37 from the Inclusive Bible. But in those days, after that time of distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon will lose its brightness. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the promised one coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then the angels will be sent to gather the chosen from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Take the fig tree as a parable. As soon as its twigs grow supple and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the promised one is near, right at the door. The truth is, before this generation has passed away, all these things will have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But as for that day or hour, nobody knows it. Neither the angels of heaven nor the only begotten, no one but Abba God. Be constantly on the watch. Stay awake. You do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like people traveling abroad. They leave their home, but the workers in charge, each with a certain task, and those who watch at the front gate are ordered to stay on the alert. So, stay alert, whether at dusk, at midnight, when the cock, the, whether at dusk, at midnight, when the cock crows, or at early dawn. Do not let the owner come suddenly and catch you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. Every year for Advent, I always am ready to like snuggle in and hear some really good things about like Jesus' birth, and I never fail to be shocked to hear that the Advent readings are not about like a little drummer boy who was there at the birth of Jesus, right? But about things like the sun and the moon darkening, the stars falling from the sky, and the heavens shaken, Merry Christmas. Yeah. So Jesus speaks these words at a particular time to a particular people. These words of Jesus in Mark's gospel were finally written down and taken out of oral tradition that they had been in uh, around the year 70. So it's capturing then something that Jesus has said some 40 years prior, okay? So let's walk through what we just read. So remember, right before this text, Jesus foretells of horrible loss and destruction, and then where we pick up is the aftermath of that destruction and chaos. You know, it starts with that phrase, after that time of distress, okay? So what Jesus describes here, Jesus isn't saying that the sun, moon, stars, heavens will actually do these things. He is, though, speaking of something that will happen that will have such a shattering and catastrophic loss the kind of climactic destruction that can only be spoken of through prophetic words and images. So these are metaphors that Jesus uses to capture that's, that which is beyond language. And when these words are written down around the year 70, it's believed, get this, that this prophecy of Jesus had just been fulfilled. It's actually happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. So we know that that event happened historically. That historical moment is documented by the historian Josephus. So we can read about the terrible tale of the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. And it was awful how people starved, they fought each other, both for scraps of food and for small-scale small political gains in the faction, factional fighting that was happening. More Jews were being killed by other Jews than by the invading Romans. The temple was destroyed. For God's people to lose the temple, the centerpiece of their life together and their life with Yahweh, there is nothing but metaphor to capture that distress, that kind of destruction and loss for the Jews. So that's how the text begins. 
Then we read how there will be this, this coming, this arrival of the promised one. Again, more metaphor about angels gathering and reuniting what has been scattered and lost. Jesus describes how from the ashes of the temple destruction, God will do something new, will draw his people together. He describes it in a parable, like a fig tree whose leaves in spring are a sign of what's to come. There will be signs of this arrival of God. And then Jesus lays it on real thick, how no one knows when this will take place. Don't know when, not even Jesus knows, only God knows. This arrival of the promised one, this uniting and gathering of all, big mystery on the timeline, okay? In light of all of this, Jesus then offers instructions. And what are they? Stay awake, be alert, constantly on the watch. So lots of exclamation points here, okay? And then Jesus closes with this final example of a person who watches the front gate. Other translations uh, say it's the doorman, so to be that person who is the first line of lookout for the arrival of the promised one. Jesus says, be like, them. be like them, stay alert. Other translations say, stay awake or keep watch. Now hear this for God's people who spoke and read these words 2,000 years ago, especially around and following the year 70, that into their loss and the destruction of their world, of Jerusalem, the temple, their lives, that even though the heavens have been shaken, there is a promise of our God who will come and to stay awake at all hours to win and how this promised one will come. This word to God's people then who had for so long suffered under empire, most recently, in 70, it's Rome, but for centuries, Israel longed to be saved by Yahweh. So they get to hear again this word that their God, our God, will come to meet them in all the ways their world has fallen apart, gathering them again in the midst of all the death and destruction, meeting them in their longing for things to be redeemed and set back to normal. If only there was some kind of connection to our experience today being anything like this, right? Though not the same, we hear echoes of our lives now, for we too have lost our life together, together in worship and here at church, as well as life together with all of our beloveds around the Thanksgiving table, don't we long for God to come to meet us in all the ways our world has fallen apart, in the midst of all the death and destruction here, to be gathered back together again, meeting us in our longing for things to be redeemed and set back to normal. This is us. This crazy reading for the first Sunday of Advent, it points us towards how we have <laughs> never been more ready for a true experience of Advent than we are right now. Advent, the word means arrival, coming, the arrival of God with us, and that is what we are waiting for. It is Advent. Like Israel, we are longing for our life to be restored, and we, like Israel, just have to keep waiting and waiting, like for this whole COVID thing to be done. We don't know when. We don't know what hour, at dusk, at midnight, by spring break, by summer vacation, or next fall. We don't know when or how this whole transition out of pandemic will happen, and let alone the fractured transitions of political power right now in our country and the transformation of our, ourselves and our systems for racial justice. We don't know the timeline. We just have to wait. And there ain't nothing more Advent than waiting. Advent gives us this annual rhythm of practicing the spiritual posture of waiting. Scott Erickson says about Advent that you are supposed to feel the wait, the anticipated arrival of something you want so badly, and by feeling the wait deeply, you'll be even more satisfied by the celebration of the arrival on Christmas Day, which again, 
Waiting is a spiritual practice. You know, Advent forms and informs how we wait in all of the things of our lives throughout the year. By feeling the weight, we'll be even more satisfied when all of the things we hope for are brought into being. So my friends, what are you waiting for? Whether connected to this whole global experience that we're in with pandemic and racial justice and politics, or more personal, infertility, depression, illness, loneliness, homelessness. How are you feeling the weight? We'd love to see your responses if you're able to just name that in the comments and let people see that. Whew, we'd thank you if you're able to do that. Because man, we are all feeling the weight. We are kicking off this Advent as like folks who are weary with and well-seasoned waiters right now after nine months of pandemic. So if you are feeling the weight, my friends, then you are like ready and poised well for like one heck of an Advent and Christmas. That's right, if things feel hard and that they're taking too long and that there's no end in sight, then you are right where you are supposed to be. Man, which is just so counterintuitive to hear that, I know. But here's the thing, this place of waiting, this is the birthplace of hope. We think of hope as like this warm, glowy, comforting thing, right? But hope can only be birthed out of what isn't. Out of deprivation, hope coexists with agony, the agony of how things aren't how we want them to be. How are you feeling the weight? How are you feeling the agony and hope too? To ask these questions, do you feel the vulnerability when we are honest about our waiting, when we feel the weight and our agony and hope that is there? This, this is one of the places where the incarnation of God happens in the vulnerability of waiting, when we are vulnerable enough to say, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know when this is gonna go, where this is gonna go, or when it will play out. I don't have control of it all. And that is terrifying. We want to know the how and the when this will be over. <laughs> and honestly, like, we never know what's gonna happen. We never have control, but it's in the waiting times that we can be vulnerable enough to name it. And we hear Jesus through this text ultimately saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you don't know. Why, Jesus? Why shouldn't I be afraid? Well, did you hear what Jesus said? He says no one knows except for God. God knows. The leap of trust and vulnerability is for us to hear in our waiting that for God to know how this is gonna go is enough. I don't have to know. You don't have to know. Dang it. God knows this God of ours who is coming. Jesus says the promised one is near, right at our door. Isn't that of great comfort? So as we feel the weight, Jesus' word of, of, of instruction then is for us now too. That in the vulnerability of not knowing, we stay alert, stay awake, stay constantly on the watch. We look around and we pay attention. And as we do, this is how we'll see the signs of God's arrival in our midst. In the wild invitation to be present to what is even in the waiting. We have all been struggling to do this, right, in the past nine months, to savor what is good, to see what is, even as we swim in the existential dread about all that isn't. That's why Jesus says this. He knows we need to hear the reminder to keep watch, to pay attention, and doing that while we watch Netflix is okay too. <laughs> but as we watch, then what we'll often find is how our fear 
fear in our not knowing, it primes us for the experience of wonder. Scott Erickson says it this way, he says, that wonder is most accessible in new situations because we don't have a narrative about what's happening. In the Bible, we very often see how fear and awe are used interchangeably in translations because they're so closely tied together. But friends, for all the ways that we feel done and how we're scared and how we don't know how this is gonna go, the invitation to be not afraid and vulnerably embrace it all, when we do that, in the newness of where we find ourselves. Man, we've never done pandemic before, right? So in this new place without a narrative to to just know what's happening, we'll also be found by wonder. Isn't this what we have seen in our lives time and again? How wonder and awe is just a breath away when we allow ourselves to be open to what we don't know. So holding all of this, bringing that for which we wait, we move into our experience of lighting our first candle of Advent, making it official, diving into this season together. So as we do, we'll sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. These are familiar words, right? But they have a fresh weight to them given what we've just learned about these te- this text and Jesus' words about Israel, about God's people, of their loss and despair. I mean, just listen. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. The promised one is near, right? So for Israel, so it is for us. Even now, we can rejoice as we keep watch. Stay alert, for even now, the signs of the promised one are here among us as we feel the weight. So friends, let us sing together as we usher in this beginning of the Advent season. Then we'll go to the home of Gila and Heather as they lead us into the lighting of our first Advent candle.